Hi, I'm Susan Dixon. I am the current uh, vice president in charge of programs. And so some of you don't know about the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. We are an organization that started in 1975. And we have monthly meetings during the school year, the first Wednesday of every month uh, at seven o'clock Pacific time. And so I wanna welcome everybody. Uh, our mission is really about to research Chinese American history and make that history known and honor it. So this is part of our um, our mission tonight, uh, the fact that we're on Zoom allows us to have a further net to reach out and get new people. But May 1st, uh, the first meeting uh, in May always has another uh, function because in our May newsletter, we announce uh, the current slate. And so, and then we open the floor up for nominations if someone else uh, is interested. So I ask Ricky, let's share screen so that I could read out those, the people who have been nominated. So uh, for the board of officers, which would, uh, the new term starts July 1st, President Ricky Leo, Vice President Gordon Hom. Vice President Programs would be Caitlin Bryant, Secretary Susan Dixon, Treasurer Franklin Ma, Membership Secretary Laureen Hom. Then uh, for members at large, we have Linda Benz, Calvin Chang, Robert Chong, Cindy Fong, Annalise Harlow, mm -hmm. Bok Jong, Karen Jong, Angela Lancaster, Grace Leo, Albert Lowe, Felicia Tabing. So this would this would mean that we would have a um, full board, which would be 17 people. However, we are opening up the floor to nominations during this meeting. And uh, so if you have a nomination of if you are a if you are a historical society meet, uh, member and you have someone you would like to nominate for the board, please put it in the chat. So uh, let's go back to full screen, Ricky. Okay, now my part is actually over. Um, Ricky and his wife Grace helped us uh, meet. <laughs> Dudley Gardner, I saw his presentation in the fall and thought everyone would enjoy it. So Ricky is going to introduce Dudley. Ricky? Hi, uh, my name is Ricky Leo. I'm the vice president of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Professor Dudley Gardner. Uh, Professor Gardner taught history, political science, and Anthropology Archaeology at Western Wyoming Community College and is the principal investigator for the Western Archaeological and Anthropological Research Institute in Rock Springs, Wyoming. He has extensive archaeology experience working on projects around the world and has published numerous books, government publications, and articles. My wife Grace and I first met Professor Gardner in 2019 at the Golden Spike Conference in Utah for the 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. We were delighted to learn that uh, Dudley was from our hometown of Rock Springs. Professor Gardner has done extensive research in the Chinese immigrants in uh, Rock Springs, including the Chinese massacre in 1885. He has a has engaged in surveys and excavations uh, and uh, in, of Chinese sites and curated uh, Chinese artifacts for 40 years. Recent reanalysis of these artifacts and additional excavations in 2021 were performed in an effort to 
have Rock Springs Chinatown considered as a potential national historic landmark. I think we will all benefit from the vast knowledge that Professor Gardner has, and I hope you enjoy his talk tonight. And if you have questions for Professor Gardner, please post it in the chat and uh, he'll, he'll be happy to answer your questions. And I'll turn it over to Dudley. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ricky. Um, it's real nice to see everybody here. I think I'll see if I can go to the PowerPoint presentation. And if you have trouble viewing it, uh, let me know. Um, so way I'm going to structure this, if it's all right, is I'm going to go ahead and present the first half of the discussion and then I'll take a pause and then let you ask questions at that point. And I mean, you can send them through the chat and I'll answer them at the end or uh, any other time, but I'll, I'll try to take a pause midway through and then um, at the end so that you could ask questions. Uh, number one is that the first time I went to China was uh, in 1972 and it was at Hong Kong. And I very much love China and I have been engaged in researching and studying it ever since. We have to make a living uh, wherever we live and so it's my archaeological work has spanned out to do work in all kinds of different uh, areas throughout the region and uh, it's always come back to doing research on southwest wyoming and the various ethnic groups and the various different people that settled there there's a lot of diversity in southwestern wyoming that's not often um, studied or looked at and the area of greatest interest to me was the chinese settlement in southwest wyoming um so I always get criticized by the way I pronounce Taishan and it's Toisan, but basically most of the individuals who came to Rock Springs in Southwestern Wyoming were from Taishan. And it's partially because of who the people were that settled there initially and their recruiting of country fellows from uh, different villages in near Taishan city. And I'll go into that in a little bit uh, more de detail. Uh, I've always been fascinated by the ceramics of, 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 of southern China and China in, 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 at large. And the one thing that first Dudley, caught up, we can't we can't see your PowerPoint. Uh oh, can't see my PowerPoint. OK, let me in show. Uh, let's see what's going on with that. OK, share screen. Share. I, it probably just sorry it was a glitch you didn't miss much so that helps okay can you see who can see this i think i, I just check out of this right this box right here and the one thing that's kind of different is the slideshow. Here we go from beginning. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So um, basically, uh, I, th this this is one of the photographs I took when I was working in China. It's from northern China. And uh, as I mentioned before, most of the immigrants who came to southwest Wyoming came from Taishan or Toisan. Um, I, I've always been fascinated with the ceramics and this is where I kind of started and went back and did this. Thank you for catching this. Um, I was always been fascinated with the ceramics from China and I saw the first sets and groups in 1972. And then when we started surveying in South of Southwest Wyoming, we found Chinese ceramics at every uh, section camp. And those are set six miles apart and they were for the railroad for maintenance of the Union Pacific Railroad. And that started us on further analysis and you can't live in Rock Springs very long without hearing about the Chinese massacre. There's nothing more written about than the Chinese massacre in Rock Springs. There's nothing less understood than the massacre in Rock Springs. It's, it's an unfortunate dichotomy. And I'll go into that just a little bit uh, as we go along. As you know, in southern China, it's very different from southwest Wyoming. Uh, first off, it's green in, so in southern China and it's brown in Wyoming. There's a reason that if you watch cowboy uh, football or basketball, it is brown because I just want to reflect the colors of the landscape. 
but you couldn't have come from a more different place to a more different place if you wanted to. Um, some people joke that Wyoming is America's answer to Outer Mongolia in having worked in Outer Mongolia. In, in a way, yes, it, it, it very much is. There's a lot of dry areas, but there's a lot of very beautiful areas. But the area that most of the Chinese from Taishin and Taishin City settled in was completely the opposite of what they were used to. Uh, you didn't have the lush vegetation. You didn't have the long growing seasons. And yet the Chinese immigrants in Southwest Wyoming were able to convert uh, a lot of the area that was seen as sterile into uh, gardens and, and make it uh, fertile and actually do a very good job of selling their crops in the local market because everybody needed vegetables. And it was because they adapted to what they found. And I'll go into that a little bit later. I, I, uh, Southern China is is where the, most of these people came from. And I always show this picture. You see where Taishin is and you see where Evanston, Wyoming is. And I take the ocean off so that you'll know that if you walk, there'd be a long walk. But as you know, in the heart of the ocean, the mid mid passage across that ocean is very difficult. And for those of you, and like most people in this group that have studied uh, the passage across the middle ocean, you know how dangerous it was, how people died across the mid passage. It was a difficult passage. And once they got to San Francisco, they had quite a trip to get to uh, uh, Wyoming. It was a very difficult trip to get, get into central Wyoming. And most came by rail, but not all. In fact, the first Chinese person inside of uh, Wyoming uh, came from came, came came to Fort Bridger by wagon train. So they came to Fort Bridger in 1857 by wagon train. The majority of those leaving uh, for North America came from the region that you you all are aware of as CE, the four counties of Southwest Guang, Guangzhou and the Pearl River Delta. The four counties of Xinyu, Taishan, Inping, and Kaiping provided the lion's share of Chinese immigrants to the New World. But specifically, Taishan provided most of the immigrants to uh, Wyoming. A lot of them came through Macau initially, but most of them came through Hong Kong at a later point in time. So there was immigration from both Macau and both immigration, the ship sailed from either Macau or from Hong Kong. And they came to San Francisco and then they were recruited to come inland. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but as you know, the Pearl River Delta was the gateway to getting across the ocean and crossing the sea. And again, you're coming from a very different area. Uh, the primary areas from Macau and Hong Kong were where the ships, where the large ships were boarded, but it was completely different getting across the ocean and into the inland west. So getting into the inland west was a difficult uh, process. The Rock Springs is dominated by the Leos, and they came from Subei, and I'm not pronouncing this right, village in Taishin. Of the 731 Chinese living in Rock Springs in 1885, 42% were Leos. That was different in Evanston. There were less Leos living in Evanston, but in Rock Springs, most of them were Leos, and that's partially because the first person that came there that began to bring Chinese immigrants to work there was a man by the name of Ase, and I'll talk about him a little bit more in just a moment. These are the counties which you are familiar with that provided the bulk of immigrants from Guangdong to the New World. And because I'm talking to a group of Chinese historians, you, you're fairly aware of this, but in most cases, very few people understand where the Chinese came from that landed in Wyoming and what their uh, cultural, what their what their culture was like. Like most don't even know that they spoke Cantonese or Taishanese. Uh, most think that they spoke Mandarin, which we all know is something that has to be overcome in trying to understand the people that lived inside of Wyoming. This is Subei Village, and this shows a location north of Taishin. It's about uh, Taishin City. It's about 15 kilometers or 15 miles. Uh, I've read it both ways. North of Taishin City that most of the Leos came from. So here I'm going to kind of break down and slow down just a minute and tell you what I'm going to talk about uh, here at this case. I'm going to look at where the immigrants come from, and then I'm going to look at Ase's entry in 1869. His name was Leo Wing Jan, and he arrives in 1869 and is a recruiter for Beckwith and Quinn or for the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, 1874 to 1875, Rock Springs Chinatown is constructed by Union Pacific Coal Company, and that Chinatown is physically constructed by the Union Pacific 
for their coal miners that live there. That's a little bit different than what you get in a lot of cases. It was a built community. And you can see that in the construction, the houses were built in a certain fashion. As I said, on September 2nd, 1885, the Chinese miners are attacked and 28 are killed. Chinatown is burned to the ground. And between September 6th and 8th, Chinese miners are returned to Rock Springs and accompanied by the US Army. They had been removed from Rock Springs for quote unquote their safety and taken to Evanston, Wyoming. And I'll dwell into that in a little bit in a moment. Chinatown is rebuilt in Rock Springs in less than one month. And what they did was they came and graded over the top of the burned area and built a new Chinatown right on top of it. Camp Pilot Butte is erected at the same time in 1885, in, in September, October of 1885. So they have a military camp built right beside Chinatown to protect the Chinese. That stays in place until 1899. And the last attachment at Camp Pilot Butte that's protecting the Chinese community is an African-American Company I uh, detachment at, at the camp in, in, in Rock Springs. Um, in, from 1912 to 1913, they start the Rock Springs Chinatown as being uh, demised, as being subdivided and sold by Union Pacific. Union Pacific doesn't gain title to that property that Chinatown sits on until the 1880s. And why that's the case is, is that the Chinatown is in Section 26, now, which is a subdivision of the township and range, but it's Section 26, which is a federal section. Union Pacific did not have the rights to that particular piece of property. So they took people that were employed by them and had them homestead that property, and they had to do it after the Chinese massacre because there was a lot of accusations against Union Pacific's policies. And at that point in time, it's homesteaded by Union Pacific employees. It's transferred by the Union Pacific uh, employees to the Union Pacific Railroad and Coal Company for $1 in consideration, the consideration being that they could keep their job. So Union Pacific owns Section 26, and they begin to subdivide it. And I've got to be careful about getting too far in the weeds on this, but it's like the Tulsa riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which most of us are familiar with, where they burned the African-American Wall Street to the ground. It was rebuilt, but later on subdivided and destroyed through subdivisions. So essentially, there's only two houses left in the original uh, Rock Springs Chinatown that comes from that era. In 1925 through 1932, retired Union Pacific Coal Company Chinese are returned to China, and Leos do remain in Rock Springs. And that's the one thing that I really want to emphasize is that the Leos have lasted longer than a lot of the other immigrants who came to Rock Springs. And the Leo heritage inside of Rock Springs goes back to the initial Leo Wing Jan. Chinese immigrants were first recruited to work on the railroad and then in the coal mines at Almy which is north of Evanston in Wyoming territory between 1869 and 1871. This is a photograph on Echo, and I'll come back to this in a moment. A commercial and geographic relationship of New York, Europe, and Asia with, with views of Hong Kong and Honolulu, I want to show this. This is, What happens in Rock Springs is part of a worldwide process of moving people to different places and getting laborers where laborers are needed and getting resources to where resources are needed. So the development of Rock Springs, Evanston, and the other communities in Rock Springs are part of a, a, an international economic system. It's part of a, the global economy. Here is Ase, who came to Wyoming Territory in 69 to work for the railroad and stayed till 1899. He died in 1899. Ase was a Leo, uh, and he, along with other Leos, came from Subai in Taishin. This is Peter Lau who gave me this information, and, and this would not be possible without Peter Lau and Laura Ng. Then 42%, as I mentioned before, of the immigrants in Rock Springs are Leos. Rock Springs, which you see right here on this, the first map I've given you, I should have put the map earlier in, in the story, but the Rock Springs that you see is in the upper Colorado River Basin. Um, it's a cold desert. It's extremely cold desert. Uh, we had uh, eight foot of snow inside of the, the compounds at Fort Bridger, um, and it's just melting. And we've had snow just recently, as recently as two weeks ago. So it's a very cold area, and it's very difficult to make a living there, but they did. And part of it is, is this is the railroad line between Evanston and Bryan, which is right by Green River, Wyoming, and then it goes over to Rock Springs, which is not shown on it. Part of the reason that it's amazing is because from Evanston to where you see at the end of the map, 
they had to shovel snow off the railroad most of the year. You couldn't use snow plows in the railroad. You had to get out and shovel it. And a lot of that was done by Chinese laborers. The repairs to the railroad were made by the Chinese laborers. So for those, most of you, as you know, the railroad was completed in 1869. The Golden Spike was driven. But the Union Pacific Railroad was in extremely bad shape. It was just abysmal. It, 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 it cratered. It wasn't laid down properly. And so before the railroad spike was driven, and this is something that's not seen until you read the Senate reports about the investigation on Union Pacific and even in the Chinese massacre, before the final spike is driven, Union Pacific Railroad actually makes a contract with laborers on the Union Pacific Railroad, and somehow Ase got engulfed in that. He was embraced in being part of the people that made friends and brought relatives over. But it was Ase who became the primary agent for Union Pacific through Beckwith and Quinn Company, which was an Evanston, Wyoming company, to provide laborers along the railroad because they needed to rebuild the railroad and actually make it functional. And they needed to shovel the snow off. They needed to reroute it. And it was just an incredible amount of work goes into it. In the old histories that you read about Wyoming, they have the Chinese coming in in the late 1880s or early 1880s or late 1870s, but they don't fix the date that they arrive in, in, in Wyoming. They arrive before Wyoming territory exists. They arrive in Wyoming in, in about 1871 um, or 18, 1868, right before the territorial territory is created, and they're there by 1871, and they're paying taxes. This right here is a poll tax record from 1873 in Uinta County. Now, the county seat for Uinta County is Evanston, Wyoming, which was shown on that map, last map at the far left, at the far southwest corner of, of Wyoming. And these are poll taxes for the Chinese. So at, at Almy, which is a coal town to the north of Evanston, there are 15 Chin Chinese men there. Uh, you pay $1 head tax for each person that's there, everybody. And that, that that's not... There's no exclusions in that. It's very much, uh, it's very much racially blind. Everybody pays a poll tax, but what it does is it gives us a count in areas that we did not have counts for for the number of people that were actually laboring on the Union Pacific Railroad. So at Almy you have 15, and at Wasatch you have eight. And I always like to talk about Wasatch just briefly. Wyoming was taxing the, the uh, section camp, which is every six miles along the railroad track, used for repairs and maintenance. They were taxing Wasatch Chinese as if they lived in Wyoming, but Wasatch is in Utah, which is a good idea. If you can get Utahns to pay Wyoming taxes, it's not a bad thing. It, it Millis, they had a smaller contingency in Aspen. One of the sites that we excavated, there were eight individuals in 1873. You can see this listed. I won't go through the whole list. You can see the list in the, the fluctuation in the numbers. Part of it is, for example, at Leroy, you might not have as much snow if this was taken in the wintertime and you might move the crews up to Piedmont or to Aspen where there would be more snow or if there was a rail break or if there was a tie break or something that had to be maintained, they would the, the, the crew size at the section camps fluctuated, but there would always be a core at these particular towns. Basically, what this shows is a, every major section camp had Chinese in the community by 1873. This map shows the relief of it, and it shows the principal areas that we've done archaeological excavations at. Aspen and Hampton are section camps. In other words, they're for the purpose of repairing the railroad. Rock Springs is a coal community. Evanston is, is a service area. It serves the Chinese community, and it involves very early on. The archaeological records indicate it was there by 1869. It, it evolves purposely for the service of uh, providing food to the Chinese who are working up and down the railroad uh, ex, ex, and that are that are living in the outlying communities. It serves Almy, which is a coal mining community seven miles to the north. In fact, this is one of the things that's often understated in Wyoming history. Almy is the first place that receives major numbers of Chinese to mine coal. And what the, what the historical record says is that the Chinese did not know how to mine coal. Excuse me, they cut the summit tunnel and they cut all the tunnels across the Sierra. They were probably the best miners in the world at the time when they begin to migrate into Wyoming. Except for understanding how to handle gas and roof fault, it's a lot easier to mine coal than it is to cut a tunnel through the, summit, the summits of the Sierras. So what you've got is an experience, what I would say minor, minor community coming in here. And why they set up at Almy is that the Central Pacific Railroad needed coal. As you know, if you go west from Reno, anywhere across the desert, they have the same problem that Wyoming does. There's not 
many trees. Uh, trees are, are just, you know, they're not in abundance. So you have to burn coal. So the Central Pacific Coal Company, Central Pacific Railroad, I'm sorry, opened a mine north of Almy and it was staffed primarily by Chinese workers. Union Pacific also opened a mine there, but Central Pacific opened it up on land that was not in part of the Union Pacific land grant. They opened it up on federal uh, property. But Union Pacific was glad to ship coal over their rails because that gave them something that would add income. Um, here, going backwards to that map, you can see where you have Evanston in the far left corner. It's cut off, unfortunately. There's Wasatch and Evanston. And Evanston had rails that ran north beginning in 1869 to service the Almy Mines. This map right here is the section map for Aspen. And I'd like to talk about Aspen in 1874. I'd like to talk about the railroad section camp in Aspen because we did excavations at this camp. Um, these are the type of houses that Union Pacific loaded on flat cars and unloaded at places where they were going to put Chinese laborers. Aspen was segregated, the, the, and, and I hate to divide it this way, because it's not just one, it's not, it's not homogenous. There'd be English people, there'd be Welsh people, there'd be Cornish people, there'd be Irish people, there'd be, in some cases, Swedish individuals, but they would live in what, quote unquote, the white part of town, the Chinese were in the Chinese part of town. In the case of Aspen, the segregation occurred so that the, the Chinese were on the east end of the railroad section camp, and the others were on the west end of the section camp. This is what it looks like archaeologically at this point in time. You can see pieces of stove that are there on the ground in the Aspen camp. And this is inside of the, the, the Chinese section of the this Chinese section of the section camp. That's double speak. But you can see the stoves that were there. And we found walks. And of course, the ubiquitous Chinese ceramics that, that uh, the archaeologist is pointing to in this photograph. When we did the excavation, what we found is that the Chinese had a more diverse diet than did other people within the area. This list that you see in small print, unfortunately, it has to be to show this on one table. This, this group that you see on the far left shows the, the, the diversity of the diet that the Chinese ha had. And Ryan Kennedy did the analysis of this so we know specifically the number and amount of, of animals that were being consumed. Pig, cow, deer, jackrabbit, rabbit, porcupine, badger, domestic cat, and small small mammals were, were cut and butchered. I put those in there because of the fact that jackrabbit and rabbit were common everywhere. Prehistorically, you see that in a lot of sites. You don't pass up a jackrabbit. If you're hungry, you, you, you butcher it, and everybody does it. So it's, it's just a common thing. Uh, the porcupine and the badger are also consumed by Native Americans. This diet that you see right here, when you take out the domesticated pig and, and cows, there's also chickens at the site, which I don't see here. But we, oh, it's under birds. When you when you take out the when you take out the uh, pig and cow, most of the animals that they're getting here are wild animals, so they're living more like the Native Americans would off the land. So they're adjusting and adapting to what's available on the land on the landscape. If you go down to the birds, you see there's chicken in the local fish are carp and minnows, and pike minnow and there's suckers. There's also imported fish. There are flounders uh, from California, and that's the one thing that the Union Pacific provided the people uh, that lived along it. You could import fish from anywhere in the world that you wanted to, and the Chinese in Rock Springs and Evanston and at these section camps did just exactly that. So you can see there's Sacramento perch, there's Sandow, uh, there's there's starry flounder and California sheephead. Uh, also, also, there's imported uh, saltfish. These are the animals that were consumed at the site. I'll come back to this, and I want to get not too far ahead of this about the pig vertebrates, but pig was a common animal that was there, and what we find is that it seems like they're purchasing the pigs from the Midwest and then finish feeding them inside of uh, Aspen and Evanston in Rock Springs, rather than raising them from small, from small pigs to larger pigs. Uh, they're finishing them. This is Osei's time sheet, and this time book is dated... Uh, 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 it's it's the 198 is is the wrong date, but it's dated in 1871. And what it looks like is I'll say is keeping the, the timesheets, uh, the timesheets for the individuals at Echo, which is just on the other side of Wasatch in Utah. So he's keeping the timesheets and other records that shows that I'll say distributed the money to the workers that were there. So they paid I'll say the money he distributed to the individuals. There were a certain amount of things that they were charged for. They'd be charged for tools. They'd be charged for other things. And I'll say was fair. And the fact that he was able to do this for the entire time that he was alive in Wyoming kind of shows his fairness and his ability to do it. 
In this case, you see that I'll say this is 1871 too. It's from the tax rolls. The census records aren't refined enough for us to know where people are moving from year to year, but the tax rolls are. So if you look the third one down where it says Chinatown, that's Ah Say right there. And he had already by 1871 accrued $400 or 1873, he'd already accrued $400 in wealth. So in the 1873 assessment roll, he already had $400 in total value and he lived near the depot. And I'll show this in just a moment. I'll, I'll say was fairly, was extremely a fair man in his dealings with individuals. He also provided services to the individuals up at Almy. Uh, this is the Almy tax roll sheet. And unfortunately, the list of individuals doesn't give names. It gives a total, it gives a total number of Chinese individuals. And I think it's 177. But where you see the 23, that's $1 poll tax for each individual. So the numbers that you see represented in that column that goes down reflects one Chinese individual. And they were divided into gangs up in, in, in Almy. Basically, they were by shifts. So the main shift or the, the shifts down some of the, the tunnels were, were, were divided up among the Chinese laborers. But they begin to extract coal, and this is the 1873 tax rolls for Almy. Until we begin to find these tax rolls, we had no idea the number of people that were living in Almy from, from southern China. We had no concept of the number of workers that were there because the census is being on the 10-year period it skipped it. So in 1880, when you have a little bit of a census from Almy, you do not have the robust numbers that were actually living in, in, in Almy because of the fact it was in an off year. In the case of Asse, and which I'm going to focus on just a little bit more here, in the case of Asse, uh, he had the first children born in the United States, uh, uh, and they were American citizens. And they were born in Evanston. And you always got to be careful about first and only, but the first Chinese children born in, in Wyoming were born in Evanston, and they were Asse's children. After the massacre in about 1887, and the massacre occurred September 2nd, 1885, after the massacre, uh, Asse sent his family home. He knew that he could not abandon his business, and he knew he could not abandon his country fellows. So he took his family back to China for safekeeping. Uh, he did not trust the situation nor the politics of Wyoming with good reason. Um, he built himself a new two-story uh, a new a two-story house in Chinatown, and it was adjoining or a new two-story building was built here. I'm sorry, I'll show you in just a second. It's not quite two-story; it's a story and a half. He built himself a house there in Evanston in 1880. So you have what's called, quote unquote, the Josh House, but as Laura Ng says, it's the temple. You have the temple in the far right. You have the Masonic temple, of, and the, you have Qigong Tung there. And then, then you have Asse's house, where the question is, you can erase that question, that is his house. So where the Masonic temple is, the building right to the left of here, is, that is Asse's, and it's pretty substantial. And it's got, a, it's got a floor above that people could sleep in uh, above it. The other buildings are retail businesses and other things that are too, uh, would be to your left as you're facing the screen. Asse's son was born in Evanston in 1884, and he wanted to return, and he did. But what happens is because of the fact that you know the about the interrogation due to the Chinese Exclusion Act, we get one of our best pictures of the way Evanston was in the 1880s. And part of it is because they had to testify that Hong Kwang Lu was born, excuse me for my pronunciation, was born in, in Evanston, so he was an American citizen. And he actually has his birth certificate, and that's in National Archives at San Bruno. So his birth certificate was provided, and he was born in Rock Springs, but he had to go through, I mean, in Evanston, he had to go through an interrogation. And what's fascinating about it is it talks about the interactions between the communities. It was said that his... He was attended by a midwife and was born in Chinatown, and the midwife was was white. There was uh, positive interactions with inside of the town, but not on a daily basis. And I'll show you that in just a moment. The other thing that it shows is that uh, there was a substantial number of people that thought well enough of the, the Asse's family to stand up and testify on Hong Kong Lu's uh, request to come back to the United States, and he did return and, uh, and lived in the States for, for several decades after that. I don't know that he ever did return to China. That I cannot say. 
the questions that were given to him, it, all of us know about because we've studied Chinese history, but the questions that were given to him as interrogation is who are you, how old are you, and how long have you been in the United States? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm giving you the wrong one. This is the person that testified on his behalf. So you had to have an English speaker testify on the behalf of the individual, but this person, this this uh, Leo Kim Jung, spoke English fluently enough, and he testified. They also had uh, uh, officials from Union Pacific, and they had uh, polit politicians testify on the behalf of his return to the United States because for Ase's sake, and he took over Ase's business in Rock Springs. Um, this is Ami in 1869, and I want to focus on this before I go to the Chinese massacre. Um, and before I do that, I'm going to I'm going to focus on on coal mines a little bit in the numbers that were raw numbers of people that were there. So I'm going to ask if there's any questions that you'd like to ask right now at this point. Now look at the chat, see what the chat says. Um, so I'm just taking a brief moment to look at it. Uh, there, there aren't any questions per se yet, but I've invited everyone to submit their questions. Okay, so then we'll, re we'll, we'll go to the development of the coal mines. You can see where Evanston here is, and you saw the Chinatown that was right there. The Chinatown that developed where you see Almy up there is kind of an enigma. I spent a lot of time trying to find the archaeological remains in Almy, and it's just, it's, it's scattered, and I don't know why that is. Um, we think that the Chinatown was just south of the town itself, but where you see the R R RMCI, the number five and number six, those were the mines that were predominantly operated by the Chinese. The unfortunate thing about the mines at Almy is they were gassy. And the problem with having a gassy mine is, for some reason, it's not advancing. Uh, let me see. Okay, for some for some reason, uh, the, the for some reason in 71, when they begin to live at Almy, these are the sections that are divided right here. When you look at the RCMI mines, they were really gassy. And for some reason, they were extremely dangerous. Um, and I don't know if it's just because of who made it. Again, here's the numbers that lived inside of Almy in, in 1873. And here's the mine. That mine would explode. Uh, the houses are near number seven mine at Almy. That mine would explode. And this is the report from the Cheyenne Daily Leader, and it killed uh, a large numbers of Chinese. Um, the community of Evanston supported them. This is the Evanston Chinatown. But essentially what happened, it, the death was so catastrophic, they didn't know, they, they couldn't handle it. It's the first mine explosion west of the Missouri, uh, Missouri River. It was one of the more catastrophic, and the most people that died were Chinese. Because of that, they mistreated the way that they handled the investigation. Chinese miners did go back into it, and the ones, a lot, a few of them that did settle in Evanston that came from there and wouldn't go back into the mines would help their country fellows up in Almy. But not until 1885 did they stop having Chinese miners work in that area. And that becomes a critical point. In Evanston, they ran swine, uh, they ran all kinds of domestic, uh, domestic cattle inside of Evanston, and they advanced pig laws. In the pig laws uh, prior to 1885, limited the number of pigs that you could run. So in Chinatown, if you look at this particular assessment book in 1885, there were 42 pigs inside of Evanston. And we know quite a bit about it because we excavated this house right here. And that house, you won't be able to see it, I don't think, is, is this one that's deteriorated right here. But we excavated that house right there. And we came upon where both the laundry was the laundry was right in this particular area right here. I don't know if you can see where my mouse is moving, but and right there beside the butcher shop. And the cool thing about the butcher shop is that where they ran the restaurant, they would sell they would sell pieces of meat also for use in, in town. And the best butcher shop or one of the better butcher shops in town was the one that was run by the Chinese. So while they had the pig law inside of Evanston, it was still an important source of meat for not only the Chinese, it was also an important source of meat for um the, the, the Anglo communities or the, the, the non-Chinese communities to the west of, China, of, of Chinatown. And the analysis of it shows basically some pretty intriguing things. 
And I don't think I've got a photograph of that quite here to show you. But one of those things that it shows, one, this is the laundry area right there. One of the things that it shows is that the, the pigs were uh, fed by corn, like I said before, but that the Chinese were also beginning to consume wheat instead of rice because they put in a flour mill. And the flour mill being right beside uh, the Chinatown made it so that they would eat the, the, the wheat. And I think what they were also doing is processing corn there and feeding the corn to the pigs. That's why the isotopic studies show that the pigs were eating more corn. And you get a change in the Chinese diet within that community where they're eating more wheat and where they're eating more maize. It causes one problem. As you know, the carbohydrates or the, the sugars that are in uh, white bread and other things like that creates a, a problem with, with cavities. And based on the excavations that we've done of burials inside of Evanston, a lot of people have problems with their teeth. Um, um, I'm very concerned about the way that we treat the people that have passed on and in, in venerating the, the, the ancestors. And so I don't like to talk about it too much, but the one thing that we do know in the analysis is that these men worked really hard, um, that they had some health issues. And I think some of the health issues come from the type of food that they begin to switch to. They still were relying on rice, but it was so much cheaper to get wheat and so much cheaper to get maize. We think that it might've affected the diet, but we're not unsure. Having said that, I'm gonna contradict that in just a moment. Uh, these are the vessels that we found in excavation. That's double happiness. These are the, the artifacts we found in that area. I just showed you we found complete vessels. As you know, the wide mouth jars for pickle and the, the narrow jars for wine. We found the full sweep of soy, soy, soy pots. We found the uh, teacups. We found everything. Now, what's inside the vessel is important. So we analyzed it. So we found inside of the vessels, we found ginger and soy sauce and alcohol, uh, possibly wine. They begin to, to, to contradict what I said earlier, they begin to grow their own food that could grow along the, the Bear River right beside Chinatown. And they, they grew pumpkins and they grew strawberries and they grew uh, tomatoes and they grew, of course, unfortunately, there's that wheat that's in there. They grew tomatoes and peppers. The issue is that when we did the analysis, the food sources there, we could see that they were relying on rubuses like raspberries and the, the, and the salmon berries. They're relying on things and they're actually selling them. In fact, your best place to get fresh vegetables was from Chinatown. So the problem that I kind of have is, is our sample too small for understanding the dietary health of the individuals in Chinatown and the individuals that we see come unhealthy to Evanston or based on what we're finding in the, the assemblage, we, it's a difficult thing to answer, and that's one of the research questions we need to address. Evanston had its distinctions. Like right here, it had a good source of water, and this ditch was owned by the Chinese. And that's one thing that's really intriguing is inside of Evanston, with all of its future problems, you could buy property if you were Chinese. So three individuals that we know of purchased property, including probably uh, say. Um in the case of the pig analysis that we looked at, this, this shows comparisons from uh, different areas in, in the West. So Point Alone, uh, we see the California, we see the California where the, the, the diversity in the animals, if you just look at the diversity of the al al animals between California and, and um, Evanston, you see there's more pigs, less chickens, there are more cattle. Now, in the assemblage that was tested right here, they didn't get the chicken in the bone assemblage. But you can see cattle and pigs are pretty high in the Evanston assemblage. Where it's in, in, in Rock Springs, it's really high. In Rock Springs, they have more chickens. Where if you compare it to other areas, like within California, you see a higher number of pigs, you see a higher number of chickens, but that might be the size of the sample. In other words, the archaeological record shows that the diet is diverse. This is where it gets really cool. And everything that I just said, I have to contradict it because the fact that there is such a diverse group of animals represented in the assemblage. So you have Sacramento perch, Sacramento blackfish, and suckers. These fish that you see right here from the Aspen section camp, and this is what's been analyzed by Ryan Kennedy. So you see the diversity of fish that they have. So I don't know if what we're finding in the burials is just the people that were sick before when they got there. In the Aspen ADNA, we found that there's Sacramento pike minnow in, in, in Carbon, uh, Car, Carbenzo, which is a, a really interesting thing. Vermeer rockfish, yellow rockfish, and gopher black uh, rockfish. This suggests to me that they have a very diverse diet. And this is the, the range of 
of Sacramento pike minnow that are finding their way into the Evanston Chinatown. In the Rock Springs Chinatown, we have find striped bass, rockfish, and Sacramento perch again, spotted sea trout, and, and sand sea trout from the Gulf of Mexico. So what you see in the longer lived Chinatown and Rock Springs is a broader assemblage of items. And possibly what you see is a, a better tied uh, trait network that the Chinese have developed in Rock Springs than they have elsewhere. Okay, in the stable isotope study of the pigs and chickens, we begin to have a, a pretty good idea about what's going on. And I've already said this before, but this just shows the science behind analyzing the bones. So the stable isotopes are pretty uh, pretty much show that the pigs are corn have a high corn input. So now we're going to move to the Rock Springs Chinatown. And uh, the Rock Springs Chinatown really does begin to emerge about 1874. And it was in existence until 1912, uh, 1913, with the disruption of the Chinese massacre in 1885, where they burned the entire town to the ground. Um, this particular uh, community of individuals, their father owned a store inside of Rock Springs and they moved to Omaha. And uh, this is Chinatown in the 1890s. Probably the healthiest that you, the Rock Springs Chinatown was, was in the 1890s. The only thing about the Rock Springs Chinatown in the 1890s after the Chinese massacre is it was beginning to age out. Uh, they couldn't replenish the immigrants into the community. So what Union Pacific did was begin to recruit from southern, the southern Mediterranean and Central Europe, Czechoslovakians, uh, Slovenians, um, et cetera, like this. But it was a healthy town. And if you can see in the far upper corner, you can see a military man up, up here. And I'm going to bring this up because the fact that things changed after the massacre, but I have to first come back to the massacre. But I'm bringing this up, the, the co-mingling of individuals within Chinatown. This is Chinatown after the massacre. You can see a uh, celebration of, of Chinese New Year. This is pretty fascinating. This is a year without snow. That doesn't happen very often. The man that is shown right here uh, was shot in the back during the Chinese massacre. Um, his name is Leo Chung, and he went to work in the uh, coal mines in Rock Springs. He would live in Rock Springs for 41 years, and he came from what is listed as Sinlin Province, uh, probably meant Sung, Sung Ning Taishin's former name, is on his employment record. 40% uh, of those who died in the 1885 Chinese massacre, uh, massacre in Rock Springs were Leo's. It's a tragic event, and it should have never happened. Um, it was led by the social milieu created by individuals that were blaming the Chinese for the problems. Um, In-depth studies have been done on it and different people come to different conclusions as to the why, but basically it boils down to the Knights of Labor. We're seeing the Chinese as a, a scapegoat. And the person who led the charge on September 2nd, 1885, and beat the Chinese man that he was working with near to death. And some people say, oh, they weren't working together. That was the part of the problem. But no, they were working in the same space. Um, they see it as something that's um, not led by this group of individuals, but it is. There is more than circumstantial evidence that it was a planned attack. The guy who started the attack was a man by the name of Isaiah Whitehouse. He was elected to the state legislature. In fact, two of the people that participated in the Chinese massacre of September 2nd, 1885 were going to be legislatures or were legislatures at the time in the case of Isaiah Whitehouse. He had taken the day off before the attack. Now what his story is doesn't jive with what happened. If you want to read about the Chinese massacre, the best simple single source of it is the Bayard Report that was sent by the Chinese delegation to the House of Representatives. It's very honest. It was signed by the Chinese uh, witnesses. It was really clear and consistent in its description. But essentially, in mine number six, where the fight started, they shut down the mine. The people went into town, and they got the arms. There are certain things that are inside of the uh, the record that shows that the arms were already stashed, the, the guns were stashed nearby. They came into town, they burned it down, they robbed the Chinese of everything that they had. The people that participated in it, the 16 of them were arrested. 
in a lot of cases were enriched by the process. Uh, one man by the name of Keenan had no money when he first came into Rock Springs. He was a coal miner from after the massacre on. He always had money until he got himself into a deep financial problem running an alcohol, running, running a liquor store inside of town. But the point being is, is that this was a planned event. Going back to it, I don't, I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the resilience of the Chinese community who came back in to that community and rebuilt that community after this happened. So two things happened on, on, uh, um, in 1885. This photograph that you see right here is the only photograph that we have of Chinatown prior to the burning in 1885. And so I'm going to use this as a point to describe what happens at that point in time. The Chinese are removed from Rock Springs and loaded on a train. They're, not, they're, they're removed from Rock Springs, loaded on a train, and go to Evanston. At Evanston, they have country fellows there, and Osei knows how to organize the, everything that's ha happening. The miners at Almi are removed on that day and made to go in, into China uh, in, into Evanston, and they're pushed out of. They're pushed out of, of, of Almy. What happened in Almy is more like what happens in Tacoma the next month, in the sense that these people are forced to flee their, their houses and their goods are stolen from them. When their goods are stolen from them like that, when, when their goods are stolen from that, it enriches the community at Almy and there's a spoilation claim where they ask for that money back. They want that, they want their resources and their money back. That is definitely planned because they begin to receive pamphlets and brochures inside the Almi Chinatown that says you must leave. So once that happens, once these, once that happens, the, Ch the Chinese are congregated in Almi. It's stated in the Deseret News that they purchased arms from the locals to defend themselves. And the Chinese says, you surprised us once in Rock Springs, you will not surprise us here. In some of the literature that you read, you, you read about the army coming to both Rock Springs and Evanston. And in Evanston, they established Camp Medicine Butte. And that's to protect the other population because by this time, the Chinese far outnumber any other group with inside of Evanston. And they're in self-defense. In the excavations at Rock Springs post-massacre and even from the massacre era, but specifically after the post-massacre and in Evanston, you find that the Chinese armed themselves. They were not going to be passive recipients of what happens next. And the reason is, is they said, well, we don't have enough money. Everything that we had is lost. And we're not going to get that indemnity claim for a long time. We're not going to receive any money from anybody at all. We have to go back to work. And they stayed. And there's an admittal by the Union Pacific Coal Company that what the Chinese did was contribute to the growth and development of Rock Springs from 1885 to 1912 when the mines begin to shut down and when the Chinatown begins to disappear. And because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, you have an aging out process of the Chinese population. But they're replaced first by Japanese workers and by Koreans and ultimately by uh, people from Southern Europe and Mexican-American laborers along the railroad. By 1900, Mexican-American uh, uh, workers and people from Mexico are beginning to take the place of the Chinese on the railroad for repairs and and uh, and and working on the railroad. This is an 1883 map of the Chinatown that I described earlier. It's in section 26 right here, which I was talking about a little earlier. The Chinese graveyard is up here. Um, this becomes a pretty intriguing situation. Again, here is a picture of the Chinatown. And this is pre-1885. It's that other map that you saw. The robbery at Almy was filed with the Chinese consulate in, in the case of Almi, if we look at what happens, you notice there's not as many Leos. In fact, there's a great diversity in the number of people that are living inside of Evanston, but this is what they lost in 1885 on September 2nd, 1885, when they're forced out. Rightly so, the Chinese massacre receives a lot of attention, but it also has to be noted that people inside of Almi suffered greatly on that day too. Um, you can see from the family names, the, the diversity of individuals here. We haven't worked on this too deeply, but we need to die, do a deep dive into it to find out what the home villages are of these particular individuals. This is the second page. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. 158, 153 miners worked in Almy 
on September the, the, the 2nd, and that were driven out on that day. The New Rock Springs Chinatown, uh, September 5th to 1885 to 1925, is pretty remarkable. And as I mentioned, it's it's intriguing. Um, it, it it's uh, there is an attempt to be fair in most cases. There's a, a temple built in in Rock Springs. There's an attempt to be fair, and I'm going to give you one example. Uh, a soldier, a couple of soldiers, beat a Chinese man. And the officer, uh, the commanding officer at Camp Pilot Butte arrested the men, and I think it's, there might have been three, arrested them, and two of them were drummed out of the military. They were found guilty and given a dishonorable discharge and kicked out of the army because of this attack. The army did bring a semblance of law and order to the community, and they were under instructions and orders to do that. And so for the Chinese community, you begin to, to see a more settled in situation uh, occur. Uh, however, Chinese continue to be killed in the mines one by one. We don't have any mine records uh, records before 1886 because after the Chinese massacre, the one thing that the, they did in state legislature was require a mine inspector to be in the mines so that people weren't dishonest about the weights of the coal that was coming in and out and that people get their fair wages. So they recorded every death. So one by one from 1888 to 1918, when some, just about the time, the last Chinese miners in the mines, there were some into the 30s, they were, uh, uh, their deaths were recorded and the cause of death was given. And it shows the mines that they were killed in. This mine happens to be number five right here. This 1880 census shows the configuration of the households in Chinatown. It was one of the smartest configurations that we saw. And when I did my doctoral dissertation on the Chinese in Montana, Wyoming, Alberta, and British Columbia, the one thing that I found was the, the way that they ordered their houses. By paying an eye to be the cook for the house, it made sure that they had good and adequate meals. And this, again, goes contradictory to what we're finding in some of those burials. We think that the Chinese had better nutrition, were better fed, and better taken care of than were the other people with inside of town. There was one other case where there was a sick man inside the house and the census taker just happened to be there when he came across this guy that was injured in the coal mines and they were taking care of him, tending him and providing him with sustenance. But the cook was the head of the household. Um, this household here just shows the way that the households were configured in Rock Springs. This again, the 1883 map. The important thing in the Chinatowns was the veneration of the dead, and this is the Chinese uh, cemetery that has since been moved to up in the main Chinese cemetery. They were disinterred and removed, either sent home or reinterred in the Mount View Cemetery in Rock Springs. But this is the Chinese cemetery to the north from the 1880s. Um, you can see that it has Taishin on this. We had this translated, um, uh, Su Lin translated this for us. And she translated that this is the case. And I'm going to stop with this right here because I've given you a lot of information and uh, I want to give a couple more pieces. Uh, this is the Mission House, the New Chinatown, 1896. Actually, I want to show something here real quick. What happened in after 1885, sorry to run through this so quick, is that the Chinese were sent home. Oh, 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 oh. The Chinese were sent home by the Union Pacific and their ways were paid back and they paid in retirement. And why I wanted to stop on this right here, in 1907, the miners went out on strike in Rock Springs against the Union Pacific. And as I mentioned, they had Japanese miners inside working for the company. They came to the miners and said to them, the white miners have walked out, what do you want to do? And so the Japanese held a meeting underground and they says, we're walking out too. They were told that they'd be protected, that troops would be brought, be brought back to Rock Springs just to stay underground in number one mine, but that's not what happened. The Union, the United Mine Workers at that point in time in 1907 accepted uh, Chinese and Japanese into the Union. So they were able to break the back of the railroad by unifying. This particular thing that you see right here is the payment by a Chinese uh, laborer for union dues. So he paid Lee Tom at the bottom, paid his dues. Uh, it, 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 it paid his dues. So this Rock Springs changed. Um, there's a lot more change that still needs to take place, but Rock Springs changed. And it became a, a it became an interesting 
concept, you know, still issues. Um, but if you look at the names in here, you can see the diversity of places that individuals came from. And I kind of want to end on that positive note of saying that there was kind of a reinvigorating or recreation of the community. And I could go on the rest of the day talking about this, but I want to get what your ideas are and maybe clarify some of the things that I just skirted over and didn't take a deep dive in. Oh, oh. So, so I saw this one that said it wasn't a Chinese name. Which one was that? Uh, it says right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. That's uh, well, he said there was no presence of Chinese in Wyoming. That's an interesting comment. That's, that's real interesting comment. So this comment I'm reading, it says, I visited the historical museum. And I think you can see it. And they said there was no Chinese in Wyoming. They were wrong. Yes, there's descendants of Chinese, Japanese Americans living in the area today, too. Um, their tombstones, they were buried there, not too far from where the uh, Chinese were buried in Rock Springs. We've translated the names. And we know specifically where they came from in 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 uh, uh, Japan, they came from Hiroshima in Fukuoka, which was a mining district in, in Japan. I misread this. Hey, Gene, is there questions that yeah, you saw? Yeah, yeah. I, I think there are a good number of them. Maybe what okay. we'll do is uh, we'll sort of officially end the, the talk, but uh, I want to actually thank you very much for a very informative, detailed, and fast moving presentation uh, you know it seems you know your experience in many locations not only in wyoming but uh, throughout the world is is quite evident so uh, let me uh, quickly get to some of the questions and i think sure. uh, people are, are just uh, uh chomping for waiting for answers um but first of all uh, do you think that the uh, well, did you feel that the Chinese Exclusion Act contributed directly to the uh, violence against the Chinese in Rock Springs? Well, I've had to do work on another massacre that was non-Chinese just recently. And what I think, yes, the simple answer is yes. Okay, so in, in, in uh, Li Ping's book where he wrote about the Denver riot, he spells that out real clearly how the development goes and that it leads towards the Chinese Exclusion Act in general West-wide political culture that evolves that's, that pushes the Chinese Exclusion Act. But I think when they got the Chinese Exclusion Act and they thought that they had the upper hand on it, and because they had the upper hand, then they thought that the violence would be a, a mechanism to go. I think the person that you had last time, remember we were discussing her name. She was a Lou. What was her name? Um, the, the name you told me earlier, Eugene. Um, uh, Beth Lou Williams. Yeah, Beth Lou Williams. I think in her book, she said there was 156 or something like that. That number might be quite a little bit off. 156 acts of violence against the Chinese after that time or in that period of time. And I think it emboldened the people. And I think that the Chinese Exclusion Act has to be held accountable for the reason that there was violence against the Chinese because it they thought, well, it's politically sanctioned that we can be violent in it. Um, I, I, it, it yes, yeah. yes. So, so, yeah, and we know that Chinese also worked at some of the uh, fueling stations or the water stations along the way. Yes. Uh, and how weren't they spaced every, what, 10 miles or 20 miles apart? Uh, six. So six. There's, and they did the same in Canada, too. So that's when I did my dissertation. I compared the two, but in Wyoming and in the, well, I got to be careful on CPR. So just for the Union Pacific, so I know specifically it's every six miles. So the, the watering stations were a little bit further apart, though. The question you said watering stations, watering stations a little further apart, but they had basically Chinese at each section camp, which was a repair place to repair the rail, railroads at every uh, five miles. Some of those folks, victims of violence? Um. If there were, ag it, yes, there was one section camp that was attacked. There was a section camp that was attacked in south of Rock Springs after the massacre, but that's the only one that I know of where there's an attack on a specific section camp. And so I, I, there was probably, there was probably violence at those places, but the, the only one that I know of that, that made it into the newspapers or the one that I can trace is the one south of Rock Springs, the southwest of Rock Springs. 
So you, you showed some images of children. Edith asked, uh, were there more families before or after the massacre? After. So I would say after, I would say after, I would say that you begin to see an increasing number of families. Um, yeah, after the massacre. And they were, were basically merchants, kids like everything else like that. And they're, they're one of the real interesting things like Ricky's family in the, the, in the restaurant families in Rock Springs, the the, uh, the restauranteurs all had children and they become go-betweens between the white community and the uh, Chinese community because they have good translators there and they become a place where people feel comfortable and going for. In the case of the old Grand Cafe, it became the new Grand Cafe. I think that Grace's father, that Grace's family owned, if I'm not mistaken, and she can correct me. But in the case of the Grand Cafe, Union Pacific relied on their translators coming from that cafe. And they developed even a benevolent society out of that cafe in the, the local uh, poverty, the local taxes for poverty for people impoverished. I can't remember what they called them. And um, speaking of the Union Pacific, uh, did the Union Pacific directly employ many of the, the Chinese or did they go through a Chinese who was a labor contractor? So and then what happened to the remains of people who were uh, casualties, you know, not only from the massacre, but also from the explosions in the mines? So that's a real good question. And, and, and uh, I think I'll start with the first part of it is that technically they were employed by Union Pacific, but in some of the things in the Union Pacific records, they said sometimes they gave the, the money to Ausay and then Ausay distributed it. Some other cases, they say that they gave it to Beckwith and Quinn and Beckwith and Quinn distributed the money, but they were direct employees of Union Pacific. So when they retired, when the people that returned home in the 1920s received their, their, their severance and they received their little pittance, what well, a small amount of retirement from Union Pacific, they were considered to be employer, employ, employed by the Union Pacific Railroad or Union Pacific Coal Company. The retirement went to Union Pacific Coal Company, uh, Chinese. In the case of the burials after uh, the 1885 massacre, that cemetery that I showed you that had Taishin on it, that's the cemetery that they were buried in. And in some cases, I think they were buried in mass burials. Uh, the one thing that we always are very cognizant of is if, especially in excavating in Rock Springs, if we find I hate to say this, parts of bodies that are there to do the right thing and contact sheriff and everybody else and make sure that they're venerated and returned to where we can. But we have not yet found uh, anything in, in Rock Springs, Chinatown yet. Um, those bodies were moved from where they were buried from 1885 up to the, the current cemetery and they're in a the mass grave, which I really bothers me. There was some money raised to put them inside of a uh, graves that gave them honor but they were put in a mass grave i think either because they ran out of money or some mistake so there is a thing that peter lau says it says 26 is kind of like the unnamed we think that the, uh, 26 individuals i think that's a number um we think that those might be some of the people that died in mine cave ends or that didn't have relatives or weren't tended to properly they were disinterred at the beginning of the uh, 20th century and put into that into that area up there in the Leos, the Leos, the Leos uh, maintain that part of the cemetery right now. So there's their family maintains the cemetery there. They they venerate the ancestors. Honored. So, so would you say then that there's one particular area where many of the uh, burials are, or are there some still some scattered uh, burials? One particular, yeah, one particular area. And I don't, I don't trust the transference of the bodies from up north to the cemetery. I, I don't trust that. I think that there's something amiss there. And we've been working on it very hard. We've been diligently trying to see if we can figure out if there are any bodies left there. Um, we've worked at that pretty hard. We haven't found any yet, but. Okay. Well, it's, it's sort of, by the way, so were there similar incidents in some of the surrounding states like Montana, Colorado, uh, South Dakota. But there were acts of violence, but uh, the, the one like the Rock Springs massacre, I think you have to get to the West Coast to emulate those, but there were some in Washington. And um, But to the gravity, I, I have to double check. You know, the hangings in Los Angeles where you're at that occurred early, was that 71? I can't remember the year of that riot in Los Angeles. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, so I... Uh, 
I've got to be careful on that one. Yes, there are acts of violence against the Chinese, like like she says in her, in Lou Wallace says in her book. You know, it's a phenomenal book, just a phenomenal book. Uh, Stephen, uh, one of our former board members, lives in Lander. He asks, "What's the uh, best way to go about visiting some of these places? You know, um, are there markers? Is there a guide? If, or, well, that's something we should work on." Yes, it's something we should work on, and it's something that we could use help with. But if you go to the City Museum in Rock Springs, they'll tell you where the significant sites are that are there. And part of the, the National Historical Landmark, we've been working on that for three years. So we had the letter of inquiry, and, and it's been approved by National Park Service. So they've designated as it, 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 it's going to be a National Historical Landmark. We had to get all the property rights because it's a mixed estate. We had to get the property rights themed out. And they're going to put a statue called Requiem up to commemorate it. There's already two commemorating plaques in, in Rock Springs, but they're kind of obscure and not they're not very large. But the contract is going out in October and November to prepare the National Historical Landmark for more uh, designation so that it goes to the National Park Service. So we're far along on that set of it. So to, to answer your question, where you can get information, go to the City Museum in Rock Springs, the Sweetwater County Museum depends on, you know, what day and the person, some are not knowledgeable because they're temporaries and then go to the temple, the quote unquote Josh house is what it's called there in Evanston. And you can take a walk from there and go over to where the dig is. The dig has been left it, it, as it is in this summer. We have to go back in there and work on it. I don't know which month we're going to be uh, excavating there, but we're going to have to go back and work on it. And there's some interpretive plaques there. Uh, Grace said they couldn't find the sign in the Chinatown as parsley because it's overgrown with uh, rabbit brush. So we're going to make it more prominent so you can see it. But they're going to do more than that. They're going to put more signs than that up. We're, yeah. Um, yeah, well, it seems like there's a, a growing awareness. And Susie, an educator here, uh, asked, is there really uh, interest by present day Wyoming in this history? Um, uh, you mentioned a museum having yeah. an exhibition or or some uh, yeah. acknowledgement, but you know, really, is there a movement or effort by uh, educators or communities to acknowledge the yeah. errors in history? Well, I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask Ricky to to chime in here a little bit, but it's like a yo-yo. There are periods of times where there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, we've given symposiums. We've had uh, humanity, humanities grants there. We've had public awareness meetings. We've brought individuals in there. But it sometimes doesn't get talked about. Yeah. In, in a state where they just have Wyoming history in fourth grade, uh, sometimes it's not even mentioned. Yeah. Well, what do you we, think? we also know that there were many challenges faced by the Native Americans too. Right. Is there may be some opening in terms of maybe acknowledgement of uh, the whatever the challenges Native Americans faced. Uh, were there African Americans or other uh, cultural groups that faced similar conflicts in the past? Yes. In, in and you're aware of the, the the view of things with inside the United States right now, but just to give you an example, we started commemorating the 1868 Treaty of Fort Bridger, which created the the Shoshone and Navajo Nation. I mean, not, Bannock, not Shoshone and Bannock Nations. And so annually on the third of July, we have the First Nations come and put on uh, presentations at Fort Bridger, uh, giving their view of the the Treaty of 1868 and 1863. So that has happened, but that's just very recently within the last five years. Yeah. Sounds like a little networking might be needed, might be oh, yeah. in order. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, a quite a few other calls here, uh, uh, questions here. Could, could I ask Ricky to chime in about what he learned in grade school about the Chinese massacre? And, and Ricky mentioned also yeah. about your family's restaurant. It was open 24 hours. I see you right. Said no, I mean, we knew nothing about the massacre growing up in the, you know, when we were little. I mean, I didn't find out about it till, you know, you know he, we came out to California. Yeah. Yeah. And, but now the, the, there's, there's more of a recognition 
in Rock Springs bought it. I mean, the art center uh, has has a yes. giant mural, yep. and the, and the library has uh, has a mural there. So there there is interest. Yes. Uh, not that you know people, I think maybe were uh, ashamed of it maybe, but now it's more open and people want to know. Yeah. Uh, and I think Amy could comment that and Amy wrote for her. Amy is my high school and junior high schoolmate and she's online right now. She can probably give you her perspective and what it was like when we were growing up going to school there. I mean, yes, I, when we were growing up in Rock Springs, uh, definitely nobody knew about the Chinese massacre. Mm -hmm. I only came across knowing uh, the Chinese massacre when I had to do a research paper for my English class uh, when I was attending Western Wyoming Community College. So that was when I became very interested in um, all this that had happened uh, to, to my Chinese ancestors here. Um, my grandfather opened up the Sands Cafe with mm. Dep Leo. He's one of the descendants of the Leos that were originally uh, that originally settled in Rock Springs, and one other gentleman I can't remember. I've been trying to get some, um, yeah, some history and some pictures from my grandfather, and he has passed already. But it's been kind of hard because we had a house fire and everything. So, and my dad doesn't really like to talk about it that much because there's still a lot of things that went on that I don't think he was even mm -hmm. really aware of. So, but yeah, um, I mean, now in, in San Francisco at the Chinese Historical Society, there's a big display about yeah. what happened with the Chinese massacre in Rock Springs and everything. And so, um, so, I mean, the word is getting out among our community and I think as, um, we just need to educate them more and um, I know the my nephews and nieces and my in-laws that are still up in Rock Springs, I mean, they don't do the research, of course. They're still busy working and just trying to, you know, make a living for themselves and everything. But once they learn more about it, they're like, I never knew about this, you know. So so it's a matter of even educating our own communities uh, a lot of times here for them to realize what has really happened you know, with our um, our ancestors who used to live there. So, thank you, Jamie. Uh, what, uh, Jamie? What business was your family involved in? Did they have a restaurant? Uh, I think you mentioned that. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. My grandfather opened up uh, the Sands Cafe uh, with two other Chinese gentlemen there, and then uh, he sponsored us to come over to the United States. And my dad used to have a tailor shop in Hong Kong. But he gave all that up and came to America, and he started off as a busboy, and then was learning to be uh, a Chinese cook, you know, as he was uh, working as a busboy, because that was at the time was what everybody wanted was to have cooks working in in the restaurants. So, okay. well, let... but by the way, have some of these restaurants uh, remained as restaurants, or are they? Uh, have they been acquired well, by uh, they others? They all think it's a restaurant. Yeah. yeah. So, so like in the case of uh, Ricky and Grace's family, their their restaurants have been there for what over eighty years. over hundred years. And um, and I really like Ricky. You have to maybe help me on this one. I really like the heritage of the Grand Cafe because the Grand Cafe used to be on the south south side of the tracks, and then the, the new right. Grand Cafe was on the north. But it had a tradition of always supporting the Chinese community and providing basically almost like the benevolent society in some communities. So they were people that looked out for their country fellows and made sure that uh, people were you know, taken care of. And I really do like the restaurant's traditions of looking out for the people with inside the community there. Mm -hmm. really so like was there a benevolent association in Rock Springs? What was the name it's of it? Rick, it's Rick. But, but, no, 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 the, the Rock Springs, Wyoming. It's not like I understand is Leo. You know how like the, all the little surname have different association mm -hmm. everywhere. You will never find a Leo association mm -hmm. in in Rock Springs or anywhere because the Leo family is so united. As you notice, they brought all the co-workers from their own village. They have been very successful. They would never really seek outside help for that, but they helped them their own village. 
Yeah. And I think that's what the big the distinguish between the Leos and other surnames in Chinese community. In in um, there, there is on one of the tombstones that said Benevolent Society, but I don't know where that was. But I will say this again about the New Grand Cafe. They were called paupers. I was searching for that word a minute ago. But yeah. there was a poor person fee that was distributed through the Grand Cafe. Uh, but yes. there was That's a minister that. by the Grand Cafe. And the county the county officers trusted the Grand Cafe so much that they allowed them to distribute food and allowed them right. to distribute clothing and stuff like this. So it was really, the, the Leos were highly thought of. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that I want to uh, point out to the audience is there is a Chinese cemetery is is basically just for the Chinese section. And that property is, I think it's donated by the uh, the, the railroad. Um, they, we go there and pay the respect to all the ancestors every year until mm -hmm. I move to California. And then every, things that, every time we go back to Rock Springs, Wyoming, that would be the first things we do. We go to pay the respect to flowers in every single tombstone. So um, that is a really highly regarded to the Chinese community. and. Our family, my uncle and Ricky's dad, I swear to God, every time I go come home from college, that will be the first thing my uncle made me do is go with them. It's usually my mom weekend. We, yeah. That is a traditional with a year after year and still being going on. Well, well I, I see from some comments in the chat that we, we might have some volunteers to organize a pilgrimage. Yeah. Yes, we would love to. We would like so, to do that. And yeah, I think we, Amy and I have been talking about it and Yes. We would like to, uh, and I think it was uh, Laura Inc. She would like to yes. organize to make a commendation on one, the, what year was that, 145? It'd be uh, 2025. Yeah, 2025. That would be the 140th yeah. anniversary. In terms of the National Historic Landmark, I wrote a letter of inquiry for the National Historic Landmark. And uh, I think I talked to Su Fong Chong about this too, because I think she worked on the summit. She could correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, we wanted to be able to get a list of individuals. So if your historical society provide a list of individuals, it would be people that we could contact. The National Park Service will definitely wants to get in touch and get in, in, input from anybody that has any kind of vested interest. And that doesn't mean you have to have lived in Rock Springs, but that you have an interest in preserving this tradition and history that you know what you're talking about the cemetery there we call it the mountain view thing and there's a different view of the way it's it's run by the city um I, i'm i'm very politically astute not to say anything that's going to get me in trouble <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know we're, we've been we could probably go on for another hour but I, and i don't want to cut this off but i, I do have actually there are a couple of questions that okay. I, I saw on the side um Kind of went for it to satisfy the uh, the archaeologist. So I saw the interesting array of fish there, and yes. wonder if uh, there were fish ponds where the fish were actually raised. Uh, Do they all come from fresh uh, nearby rivers? And then uh, your commentary about pigs that was also of interest, I think, to uh, mm -hmm. to Laura uh, because she's also uh, that's also an area that she's been looking into. Right. Um, the, the 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 it's too cold for some of the fish that they had there. So even if they were able to, they'd have to run hot water through there because the the waters are just some some of them run between thirty three and forty five year round. So that they're, they're that cold. But they also fish for local fishes, and I, I forgot to mention that. But they're salmonid in the assembly, so it means they're eating trout too. But most of the stuff they're importing, we think it's pickled or not pickled or salted. I think that's what Ryan Kennedy thinks that that it comes not necessarily fresh. I mean, you could get it relatively fresh from San Francisco to Rock Springs, um, but, but yeah, I'm not sure. We didn't have fish ponds, but we did have fish ponds because where you could accumulate trout and suckers, they did have those kind of fish ponds. Yeah. Uh, did did Chinese uh, lease land or own land at all? They own land. There's they, a lot of recent discussion about uh, yeah. states like Texas or Florida uh, uh, bringing back alien land laws and wonder if Wyoming had a similar law. They did not. And they were very good and very, from what I can, the areas that I've worked in, they could own property like the, the the ditch company that I showed you there, they could actually own water rights to it too. So they could, well, they, nobody owns the water rights. The state of Wyoming owns water, but they could take water off the ditch and own the property there. Um, so yes, you could own property. 
in in Wyoming. Yeah. yeah. My my uncle's grandfather um, that owned the Grand Cafe, mm -hmm. and then later on the new Grand Cafe, he owned four or five properties in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Yeah. Before. So they own the land beneath it, not just the building. Yes. Right. They own the land and the building both. Uh, now and there's they a. So it's our restaurant. It's owned by the the, the Leos. They own. It, it, oh, go, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Grace. Uh, yeah. The Chinese restaurants are always owned by the property owner that own the restaurant as well. They also own the business land. I'm sorry, Grace. Property. I didn't mean to step on you. <laughs> no, I just want to make sure. But the one exception would that be is after 1922, and that was a change in federal laws, you could own the surface down to the mineral rights. Before that, even the Chinese could own mineral rights in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. That was a federal that was a federal law change. Mm -hmm. I think it was 22 or 24, somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, Supan, our historian, uh, watching comments that there were ice cars that were yes. uh, in in the trains that uh, that could bring in the, the fish. Oh, that's good. That's good. She's right. And they had ice ponds there at Evanston too. And part of the another job you could get was cutting ice at Evanston. Yes, that's a good point that she brings out there. Yeah. Um, and let's see what else. Yeah. Um, Eugene, I um, yeah. and Dr. Gardner, I was really curious to see. Um, so, who really sent the recruiters? to China uh, to secure laborers, the Chinese laborers to come? Was it Union mm -hmm. Pacific or Central Pacific? Well, the Central Pacific was first and they recruited the most. And then Rock, the Union Pacific followed, followed their lead and they developed that system. In the case of what uh, Ase did was he had his connections back at home and there was a company developed and it actually was one of them was out of the Grand Cafe where they had an association. They said, if they want to, this is what they can do. When they brought back Ase's son, that association helped them get him get back into the country as a citizen of the United States. So um, they, they would write back and say, yes, this is the kind of person. But after exclusion, after it was, you know, you know, the you know, the situation. But um, yeah. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a comment from Supan about the indemnity paid by, by China. Uh, but actually, there's under, beneath that is another question. Uh, were the perpetrators of the massacre, uh, what happened to them? Nothing. Nothing and absolutely nothing, and that's that, and that's a problem. And I've, I've begin because I've had to study a couple of massacres that were different than just that, like First Nation massacres, and massacres of immigrants, mass and massacres of other things. The one thing that I think that the mob does is creates this anonymity, and some of the people that are participating in the mob think that they can get by with something that's inside of their soul. I don't know how to say it any other way. They can get by with it, and so that's one of the reasons they perpetuate it. There's something going on with mob violence. Our founding fathers feared it, and that's one of the things they feared was themselves and the people, and it's just kind of a crazy thing. But the case of the Chinese massacre, it's almost a case book study in these people getting off. And the issue of it is, except for two of them, they weren't that well healed. So what I tried to trace back was who paid their bail? Who is paying the bail of these individuals? Where is this money coming from for them to get out of prison? They were in jail one night. Now, that, that thing I've done a great deal of drilling into and because of the fact that you get caught into it, and you fall down a rabbit hole. When you look at Isaiah Whitehouse, he moved to um, Yakima and he thought he was immune from ever being prosecuted. And he lied when he got up there. He said he came from Cripple Creek. He had been a state representative and eventually he was going to be found out. But at some point in time, he got to thinking, I'm above the law. And part of the reason that we know it was him is because he had a son born there. And we were able to trace him through the census records, which you can do a little bit better through ancestry right now. But he ran for political office. True to form, he ran as a socialist. But what the people that investigate him, I think it was B, what B said about him, he was a ne'er-do-well and a nasty individual. He ran for socialist and got four votes. And that basically to me says, yeah, this guy is a jerk. And he was always a jerk and he died as a jerk. But he had grandkids and he had family and they, they you know, he, he was, he escaped the long arm of the law. And that I do What's not like. Was there a, a, a trial? Well, is there a trial transcript that 
that has been analyzed also. There's an arrest record that you can analyze and you can take and look at their heritage. And then one thing that there was supposed to be is excluded from ever working for Union Pacific. So I went through some of the survivors on the other side and looked at them too. And when I first started doing this, they told me not to drill into it and not to look into it. That was in the 1980s. They said, don't look into these families because their families are still here. Yes. And the, there's a certain amount of shame in the family knowing that they were part of that history and that heritage. So they 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 uh, they feel the shame. They feel the shame of it being passed down. In the one case of the one individual I know, he was 17 years old, and he was born in the U.S. That's another thing that said, and that's the first thing that started getting me to look at it. They said these are foreigners that created this problem. Yes, indeed, some of them were. But in the case of White House, he came to the United States when he was seven. In the case of Keenan, he was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And the same thing with some of these other individuals. And the one guy was 17 or 18 that participated in it. I think he was duped. I think he was drawn into it. I don't know if he actually killed anybody, but he did steal stuff and he did burn houses. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's guilty. He's guilty, but they didn't prosecute him. The, so, the rest records are there. The rest records are there. You know, we, we could we could go on. Uh, you know, there, there's so much discussion that we could have, and, and especially when we have some very interested and motivated people in the audience here and we have many many friends out here who are either uh, longtime members or new members um, and and just long time I, I would say old friend but i would get criticized for that but mm. uh, I, I have only long time friends i don't have old friends um, mm. <laughs> anyway uh, the, the, i i want to um uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Gardner, for really enlightening us uh, with this history, mm -hmm. of which there's still, so, see, it seems, so much more to mm -hmm. literally dig into, as, as well as uh, 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 to do more research into. Uh, so we really enjoyed uh, learning about this, and maybe you can come back and tell us about your other digs in uh, other Chinese sites in places like uh, Auckland in New Zealand or sure. in other parts of the world. I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've been focusing on Chinese American history, but yeah. I think this worldwide diaspora is this uh, awesome phenomenon to uh, to try and get our wrap our arms around. And uh, just the fact that we have uh, we as a historical society have been sharing uh, research and presentations like yours for yeah. the past 48 years. Uh, it just tells you that we're, we're just uh, still uh, on the road to, to yeah. learn a, a great deal more. So thank you. Uh, if I can call you Dudley. Uh, you know, sure, you like can. To, sure. Love to, to uh, welcome you back. Uh, yeah. in the future and now i have to turn to uh, some uh, uh housekeeping uh eugene right would, you, would you mind if i interjected one quick point sure the, the fiji site that we worked on became a is part of the component of a making a unesco site at lavuka was the chinese cemetery so i would love to come back at some future time and talk about how it became a unesco site and what all was involved in what we did in the excavations there within lavuka through the chinese yeah. component of it the in Fiji, Fiji, in the yeah. Fiji Islands. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would love to learn more. Yeah. Uh, you know, earlier I, I asked you about uh, Samoa, where my mm -hmm. great uncle uh, yeah. went uh, way back. Uh, so, um, to to everyone, uh, thank you for joining. I'd like to just comment on uh, upcoming meetings uh, next month. Uh, we'll learn about the the Chinese community in another historic place in Red Bluff, California. I don't know how many of you have driven up I-5 uh, in the northern Sacramento, uh, Sacramento Valley, Sacramento River Valley, but uh, at the far north end is a town called Red Bluff, and we're going to hear from uh, Jessica Chu, whose family was very much involved in the, uh, not just populating, but uh, also uh, uh, operating, uh, running a business, and 
uh, running businesses and also uh, uh, involved in the economy, local economy, whether it's in agriculture or other uh, engagements. So we're very fortunate to have a speaker next month, which will be June 7th, Wednesday, June 7th. And we, we hope you can join us. I want to make a couple of quick announcements too. Uh, we do have our Yosemite pilgrimage uh, planned out. It will be uh, for two full days in, uh, in October, October 6th and 7th, Friday and Saturday uh, in Wawona. And uh, we, we've got a couple of cabins uh, reserved and also campground space reserved for those who want to camp. So we're going to see a, a couple of new things and also uh, revisit the uh, the uh, Chinese laundry in Wawona. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, that there is an upcoming uh, Chinese American architectural heritage tour in Pasadena. Mm. Um, I don't have the flyer yet, but we're going to post it in our on our website when I do have it. Uh, so it involves looking at buildings that were influenced by Chinese architecture, including the Pacific Asia Museum. And then it will also include visits, uh, a visit to the uh, Chinese garden at the Huntington uh, Museum, uh, Huntington Galleries and, and Library. Uh, and then this coming Sunday, I want to mention that some mm -hmm. of us will be uh, uh, driving up to Santa Barbara, uh, where the Santa Barbara Genealogical Society is hosting mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Asia Pacific Heritage Month uh, event, and the Historical Society will be tabling. So Susan Dixon and Linda Bentz and maybe a, a couple more of us will be uh, cruising up Highway 101 to Santa Barbara. So that event will be from 12 to 4 at the Santa Barbara Genealogical Society. So I hope some of you can, can join in. And while we're there, you can go to the uh, Santa, uh, Santa Barbara Historical Museum to see the, um, the Chinese shrine that is uh, displayed, exhibited there. Unfortunately, not in its original location, but at least it's been preserved. Um, that's that's it you know it's um, past our bedtime for some of us but <laughs> we want to actually normally uh uh professor gardner we, we normally if we were meeting in person we would invite you out for celia for dinner um, <laughs> for snacks uh in our favorite chinatown places and uh, i see uh michael kwan out there in the audience and that was one of the things that and Don Lu, you know, uh, out there, uh, something that we all would enjoy doing. And by the way, uh, friends, I, I see many people out there, whether it's Irene or Edith or Jeff or uh, Donna, Carol, Mimi, Barbara, you know, friends are out there and, and we, we, I really miss you. We are open uh, most Sunday afternoons. And so if you feel motivated, you can, can drop in. And uh, we, we actually have many visitors uh, come do research. And when people are coming to uh, look at our, our library or our archives, we tell them, well, that's sometimes the best day because uh, there are volunteers uh, available to help uh, with their research. So, uh, so we would look forward to seeing some of you drop in. And Wei, I see you last time when we saw, I saw you, you were walking your dog in Chinatown. So maybe you can come and walk over to uh, Bernard Street. Anyway, I'd mm -hmm. um, like to wish you all a, a good evening and uh, thank you all for joining in. Uh, we hope to bring you more history. And thank you, Professor Gardner, for making this a very enjoyable mm -hmm. evening for all of yeah. us. Thank you. Thank for, you. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. And bye.